In this module, let's talk a little bit about roles and role theory. Roles are something that I find extremely important and extremely difficult. I find it important to talk about roles and role theory because obviously in our job, we have a certain role that we play and we will get back to playing a role later on in this video. Playing roles is something that we do at work, that we do at home, that we do at in our spare time. So we all have different roles, which makes role management quite difficult at a certain point. It is also difficult to have transitions from one role into another role, which is something that we will also cover in this module. And obviously, it can be quite helpful if you are in a role that you play this role very well. Probably you could say that you are an actor as a leader and play your role in order to get an Oscar at a certain point in time. So let's dive into roles and role theory and probably start with something very controversial and then wrap it up. At the end, hopefully giving you the idea about why it is important to function to use that word in your role very well. Before we dive deep into the theory, let's talk about three different elements. We are going to talk about the person, which you will see on this slide, the role, which we will cover in the next slide, and the organization, which will be the third slide. So let's talk about the person, the individual. And I would say, and that might be quite a controversial thought, and obviously a thought that most HR people are most likely to reject. And that is that the person, the individual, is not at all relevant for the organization. The individual, the person, is not relevant at all for the organization. And I will contradict myself at that point when I talk about how to act in a certain role later on. But let's stick with the thought that the person is not at all relevant for the organization. There is only one thing that is relevant for the organization, and that is the role that a certain person, a certain individual takes up, because the organization doesn't need the individual at all. It is not important who is playing the role. It is just important that the role is being played in the orchestra of the organization. So let's take a look at the role in the next step. So this is the important aspect for the organization, the role that the individual person is taking up. And here you can see the connection between the person and the role that will be important later on when we talk about the organization. So what you can see here is that each individual, each person is taking up a role. And if I say a role, usually I mean multiple roles. What I am not talking about is private roles that you have in your family, roles that you have in your spare time, in different clubs, wherever you are. We have multiple roles and we will talk about that later on. Let's focus on one role that you have in the organization. For example, a leadership role. You are an executive in the organization. And what you do as an individual is you put up a mask. You are a persona. So you play something, you play your role in the organization. And this is partly a fantasy, which leads to a couple of problems that we will talk about later on. And this fantasy is something that you bring into the role. So you bring the role to life. And as I said earlier on, you as an individual, as bad as it sounds, you are not at all important for the organization. But what is important for the organization is what you see here. That is the role that you take up in the organization. So I mentioned organization a couple of times. Let's take a look at the third part, the organization. What we see here is the last part of the trias, the person, role, and organization perspective. And now it becomes apparent why the role is so important for the person, for the individual. Because like I said multiple times now, the individual is not important at all for the organization, but the role is. So what is important from an organizational perspective is that you take up a certain role that a role is being filled. Look at me as an example. I as an individual, me as Jürgen, it is not important at all for the HDW to if I or that I do this type of work now that I talk about 
roles and change management and everything that is connected to it. What is important is that my role, the professor of organization behavior is being filled for the organization. The organization needs the role. The organization doesn't need me as the individual. And that is the beauty of the role because the role is connecting the person with the organization. So I, as an individual, I, as Jürgen, am connected to the organization, the HTW, my university, via the role that I take up. And that will become very central later on if we talk about changing roles, because this is endangering the connection between the individual and the organization. So the role is something that gives sense for me, that connects me to the organization and the role is something that is very important for the organization because this is what the organization needs to follow or to fulfill their primary task, which is something that we will cover later on or in another video. Let's talk about quite a problematic aspect that is beautiful, but also very problematic. And then we are going to dive a little bit deeper into theory at this point, because what you see on this slide is that the role is being filled from the perspective of the organization and from the perspective of the individual. So both parties project something, the greenish thing that you see on the slide, into the role. And they project their fantasies into the role, which means that the organization has a certain idea how this role is ideally being performed. At the same time, the individual, you, or in this case here, me, I have a fantasy how this role, being a professor of organizational behavior, is ideally filled. And in the best case, the fantasy of the organization and the fantasy of the individual overlaps to a very large degree. If it doesn't overlap, the individual is doing something that the organization doesn't expect the individual to do. And that can lead to chaos and to problems. And if you are a leader yourself, you might have realized this problem when you first came into a leadership position. In my experience, very often leaders ask HR, for example, what is expected of me in the role of a leader? And quite often HR says, leave an impact bring the organization forward, whatever they say, sometimes very fuzzy. And this is very problematic because the fuzziness obviously doesn't help the individual to get to know how to fill the role. So the individual tries to fill this gap with very good intentions. In most cases, I would say having a fantasy how to fill the role. And again, in the best case, both fantasies overlap in a very bad case scenario, they don't overlap. And maybe at this point, it might be interesting to talk about leadership guidelines that we will do in a later video, because I think that leadership guidelines and rules how to lead in an organization are total nonsense. But let's talk about that later on. So what is important here is two fantasies. And in the best case, they overlap. In a worst case, they don't even meet at all. What you see on this slide is a girl dressed up in a beautiful costume. That is something that we usually do in the area where I was born and raised during carnival. So we put up a costume and play a role. And obviously this role is quite a fantasy, something that I talked about earlier on. So the problem is with these fantasies that expectations towards roles are mostly unclear. The organization thinks that they know what a good leader is and you as an individual think that you know what a good leader is, but both perspectives are fantasies. And we will dive deeper into that, into uh, technical aspects and the fantasy aspect a little bit more later on. But uh, at this point, let's stay with the thought that expectations towards roles are unclear. And those of you who came into leadership roles into leadership positions, you might remember that you probably felt a bit unsecure. What does it mean to be a good leader? And probably some of you have asked HR, what does it mean in the organization to be a good leader? And in the best case is HR has given you a very clear answer about that. In 
the worst case, HR has told you, let's bring the organization forward. Let's be, they are sometimes very fuzzy about these type of things. And that's not very good because it is increasing anxiety. It's increasing uncertainty and people don't like that. So what we do is we fill this gap, this void of information with our own thoughts, with our fantasy about what the ideal role can look like. The problem here is, again, expectations towards roles are very unclear. And that is even true for fundamental roles, which is probably the question, what is a good man or what is a good woman? Think about that. You are probably able to answer that question for yourself individually. But if you start discussing that with some friends, you might realize that there are different perspectives about what is a good man and what is a good woman. If you broaden that discussion and discuss it with different cultures, with different age groups, the perspective on what is good and what is bad, if you want to use these terms, will probably deviate pretty much from your perception. So if it is unclear for these roles, for these fundamental roles, how difficult can it be for roles that are not so fundamental, that we are not so used to? The problem is, that we need roles, we need to talk about them. And I think that is partly the solution that I will also talk about later on, how to solve this fantasy issue and this issue of overlapping fantasies or not overlapping fantasies, which is the issue here. We need roles and we need to talk about them because roles are mental fences that create social order. We need them. So we need to be very clear about roles and role boundaries in a certain case. So it is quite important to discuss them in the organization. And I would totally encourage you, if you are part of a leadership team, discuss with your peers what is good leadership. You will probably not be able to agree on something, but at least you have put on the table what is important for you and what is important for others. For me, it is also quite helpful to discuss that with your team. So what is your fantasy of being a good leader? And what is the fantasy of the team of a good leader? And in the best case, you find an overlap where both sides are quite happy. The problem is, and I mentioned that earlier on, that you do not have just one role. You have multiple roles. And very often, these role obligations are over-demanding which means that at home, people expect you to be 100% a father or a mother. In your job, people expect you to be 100% a leader. And you probably could say, well, if I'm at home, I'm at home. And if I'm at work, I'm at work, which is, I would say, the best case if you have these clear boundaries between the roles. But the work force or the world of work we are in right now, from my point of view, is eliminating these boundaries and it's more and more fuzzy. There are less boundaries between work and home, especially since COVID, where we started to work at home extensively. The role boundaries got more and more fuzzy and the transitions are more abrupt. And these transitions between roles might be an issue because if there is some kind of role spill from one role into the other role, think about the father who is a very successful manager and tries to manage his family at home. This obviously doesn't work. Think about the caring person at home who starts being very caring in the job. That might be very good, but it might also be very inappropriate depending on the requirements of the position. So transitioning between roles might be an issue. And the fundamental question here is how to spend your energy not to get drained and to get overrun by the total role obligations that you have. Then sunny side here, because it sounds a bit negative at the end, the sunny side here is that some people argue that different roles can give you energy so that you draw energy out of certain roles and they're not always draining. They can also energize you if you're in something. But keep in mind that roles are a fantasy and if you don't talk about these fantasies, you think that you're living in the ideal world and the other side also thinks that you're enacting the ideal role, but you never really see how much your fantasies are overlapping. So talking about these things is quite an important thing from my point of view.
Let's talk about switching cognitive gears. Let's talk about crossing role boundaries and probably changing the identity that is associated to each and every role you inherit. So the boundary is quite an important thing because it's an interface with the environment you are constantly in. Your private environment, your professional environment, other social environments in general. And these boundaries are very important because they are kind of a mental fence of a certain border. And the border is very important because it is creating social order and is differentiating certain domains. Like you know you are at home and you know you are at work. And the tricky thing here is, and I probably mentioned that on another slide already, that these domains are getting more and more fuzzy, that the border is getting more and more permeable when we work at home, which is kind of a good thing because it's adding flexibility and it's kind of a bad thing because it's making the boundary a bit more fuzzy, which is a problem as we will see later on. But that will be a totally different discussion about new work and kind of these things. These boundaries are usually socially constructed and agreed on, but also very flexible based on your individual interpretation. So we cannot say that this is work and this is home. Usually we agree on these type of things. So if we go into an office, this is work. If we are in our private apartment, this is home. This is basically what we have agreed on more or less, but they can become fuzzy as we have realized not only during COVID. So they are somehow flexible, these boundaries. They are permeable, these boundaries. But this can create certain conflict if we have a role spill. And that is a problem because it's affecting your identity. So let's talk about that a little bit and the patterns that we have in certain roles. So the role identity is the content of the role that is socially constructed. Basically, your definition of yourself in role. And we have talked about certain fantasies. We will talk about task systems. Uh, you remember that the sentient system of role and these things. So these are specific presumptions and patterns of in-role behavior. And they sometimes exist independently of you as an individual, which is something that we will cover on another slide. And the problem here is, and that's the important part, if there is a gap between different role patterns or different role demands, the more difficult the transitioning between them will be. Because if you don't manage the transition, then there is a role spillover. So sometimes it is quite important to be very aware in which role you are right now to act appropriately to the role demands. That is probably the reason why some of my friends tell me that they like to commute. They like to have the drive home from work because during this 30 minutes, 60 minutes, they can switch cognitive gears and make the transition from work to home. And that is getting more and more difficult, obviously, if we work at home and just leave the room and we are in another environment. The role spill is more likely in that case. Also, the greater the delta between the different roles is, the more difficult the transition, the easier to avoid spillover, the lower the delta is, so the easier it is to transfer from one role to another, but the more likely that role spill will occur. And that can be a problem if, for example, you start to manage your family the way you manage your team. Let's dive a little bit deeper into theory here before we get back probably to the slides about personal role and organization. And I already talked about fantasies. And to make that a little bit more precise, uh, we're talking about role alignment. So in which way or how much do these fantasies overlap? And we can talk about the role that is given by the organization. It's given to you as the role taker and you are taking the role as an individual that is given to you. The given part of the role is the so-called task system and the taken aspect is the so-called sentient system. And let's talk a little bit about those two. The task system for me is maybe the easier 
aspect because this is your job description if you have something like that where it is very clearly stated what you should do and sometimes what you shouldn't do so in your job descriptions there are explicit expectations of the organization about how to fill a certain role how to align to the role very often that is defined by so-called role influencers which is usually your boss your direct manager and they decide what to do the problem sometimes is there is the official document which is the job description and there is the real document which is very often unspoken which is the expectation of your boss and the problem here is that even those two things sometimes don't overlap because the job description sometimes is something that is provided by HR, but it's not really the reality of what is going on. So again, it is very important to make the expectations very, very explicit and the real expectations aside the job description if there is a mismatch, which is quite likely from my point of view and my experience. This is also the basis of your performance evaluation. So it's quite important to get to know how your role influences are defining the given aspect of the role to get pretty well aligned to the role. You have to submit to these things, which is an entirely different topic that we will cover in another module. Let's take a look at the taken aspect of the role of the role alignment. That can mean that you are creating you are entirely creating the role that you fill the role uh, so the role is unclear from the organizational side so you can build it your own and that is happening sometimes in startups if a role is created completely anew very often the first role inhabitant is defining the role they're making the role and that is constructed and interpreted very subjectively which is a good thing because this individual is creating the perfect role for him or her but obviously that can get problematic if the person is changing who is taking the role the next person will have another sh subjective perspective on how to enact a perfect role and that is creating a problem because your role in Ackman is your ideal view of the role of the role which probably at certain times doesn't match reality or it doesn't match the given aspect the explicit or implicit expectations of your boss and you can observe that in others if you observe their daily task routine so what are they doing on a daily basis and how are they doing that that is not necessarily the given process but this is how the organization is functioning so if you observe the daily task routine you will get an idea about how the individual taking up the role is subjectively interpreting the ideal view of the role if you observe their daily task routine and then you have to check that this daily task routine does this ideal view of the role incumbent the person who is having the role does this meet your expectations as their boss for example so again here it's quite important to make explicit what are your expectations towards the role and what is your boss's expectation towards the role and try to align them in the way try to make the fantasies overlap as much as possible Let's continue talking a couple of minutes about the task aspects before we get back to the sentient aspects of the role, just to make it clear what the task aspects of the role are. And I mentioned a couple of them already, probably on another slide, because the task system are aspects of the role that belong to organizational structures, procedures, and technology. And now that is the important point that exists independently of individuals so i can probably change i can leave the organization someone else is taking up the role and this person knows exactly those aspects of the role that are procedures that i have to follow for example and so that is a good thing because i make the role independent of individuals which is beneficial for the organization because i can swap individuals so if they leave or retire or for whatever reason leave the organization 
it is not that much of an issue. So that's actually quite a good thing for the organization. Very often these task aspects are very conscious and tacit knowledge. So it is very explicit what you have to do and sometimes what you don't have to do. And the good thing is that these are recognizable part of roles where conscious expectations are built and organizational rituals of performance measurement occur. So that is very transparent, that is very measurable in the best case, and you know exactly what to do and what not to do. And if you work in such a role that is clearly defined, it is very recognizable that you are in a certain role. Very easy thing is if you are a cook in an organization and you are responsible to cook something, you cook a meal every day for the workforce, then this is a very clearly defined aspect of your role that is existing independently of you as an individual. It is very cons conscious and tacit knowledge that you have to perform this task each and every day, a very clear expectation, and we can measure you against whether you do that or you don't do that. As a cook, it's quite easy to define that. As a leader, probably it gets more and more fuzzy, but it's very, very important that these clear aspects are talked about and that they are defined and that you know them to align yourself to the expectations of the organization. And here's the sentient aspect of the role again, which is basically, let's call it the feeling side, the soft side of the role. And very often that is created or defined by social processes, by emotional experiences of how to be a good leader, what is a bad leader, maybe an experience that you have made in your time before you became a leader. I always say that you become surprisingly similar to those leaders you have already worked for. It can be very unconscious how this part of the role is being created. And again, it's a fantasy. And the important part here is uh, what you can see on the right side of the slide, the first bullet point that this part of the role arises from hopes and fears associated with the role. So you are projecting certain hopes into the role and role enactment, and you have certain fears associated with the role that you're doing a good job or that you're doing a bad job. And that's something that we will cover in another video as well, how your expectations are influencing your role in Ackman. And I like this, uh, this quote that it seems as if the identity of an individual is both, the identity of an individual in the role of a leader is both at the same time anticipated expectations of others, how to be a good leader, and the individual's answer to these anticipations. So, Crafting the role of a leader can be a dance. And at the same time, it's a fantasy because you think what others expect from you if you don't talk about them. And again, not a big surprise, talking about expectations is quite a crucial thing to become a good leader in the organization. You will have a problem if the expectations of others are totally different than your own expectations to the role, but that's completely a different topic that we will have to cover when we talk about leadership and leadership theory. I find timing and the time aspect quite interesting when we talk about roles and role taking, because people develop transition scripts and role schemas over time, and that might make roles and role taking more stable, and the good thing is that stress is reduced, but also the downside is that flexibility is reduced to change the role and to adapt to a new role probably, or to grow with the company, to change with the company and change your role according to that. And it's very often an unconscious process. What we're doing here in this mini lecture, so to speak, is we are making the unconscious conscious while talking about expectations and role fantasies, which will probably make it easier to change your role and question your role. But usually this is a very unconscious process. You don't realize that you develop transition scripts and role schemas, and that makes it harder to change roles over time. And the next problematic thing that we will pick up when we talk about leadership in another module, is that there is a difference between the professional role and the private role 
And there are just these are just two of many roles that you have. And the private role is the so-called veridical role. And that is going to create a huge problem for leaders who are very, very successful. Let's call them rock star leaders like Elon Musk and similar type of people. Um, and it is very risky if you get as a leader into a very prestigious leadership role. On the other hand, there is a desire to get into these type of roles because there is a fundamental desire to get prestige and status that you will usually get if you are in a leadership role. And at that point, I recommend to watch another video about feedback and how difficult it is for a leader to receive feedback if this prestige and status is achieved and threatened by feedback of employees, which is quite an interesting topic again that I will cover in another video. Let's get back to our image that we have seen earlier on between the person, the role and the organization. And what you can see here is that the organization has significantly increased. So the organization has changed and it has grown so to speak, which is quite common, especially for startups. They scale, they become larger, and suddenly out of the four people organization, you suddenly have 80, 100, 120, and so on. And what is happening is that you basically stay the same. So the person, the, the individual stays the same while the organization is growing. And when the organization is growing, it's quite likely that your role is getting more and more defined. So there are less things that you are able to do and you're getting more and more specialized. And the problem here is the change of the organization and the role, but the non-change of the person, of the individual. And that can be very, very tricky. Think of a leader as a metaphor of a key so a leader, a person taking up a role, and it can be also a non, not a leader, specialist, you are like a key and the key has a beard. So you have ups and downs. There are spikes in your abilities and your skills. And you were hired by the organization at the time you were hired because you as a key were a perfect match to a lock. So you could open a door, you can unlock something, or you can close a door, you can lock something. And at that point, when you were hired, the organization thought that this is a very important skill for the organization to have. The problem now is over time, if the organization is changing, if your role is changing, and you still are the same key, at a certain point, you don't match the lock anymore. And the tricky question for me here is, and I talked about that already when I talked about stability and instability of roles and role transitioning, are you able to change your identity as a leader to change how you perform your role? And that is not a very easy answer because you have to adapt. And from a company's perspective, for me, it would be quite important to think about, okay, how do we support leaders in the organization to adapt to these changes? Because if we don't do it, if we don't support them, there is going to be, or there can be, a huge problem ahead because we have suddenly, we suddenly have leaders in positions who are in charge, who don't match the organizational requirements anymore, which is increasing anxiety and making bad leaders in the worst case. So let's take a look about what is happening to you if we change your role. And to do that, we have to go back into your early childhood. Let's talk a couple of minutes about the relationship between you and your mother. I know that might sound strange, but we will link it back to the personal role and organizational aspect in a couple of minutes. So when you grew up as an infant, you have developed a certain attachment style to your mother, probably also to your father, depending on how much time you have spent with whom, but research mainly focuses on the mother. So let's take that for granted for now. And you have developed a certain attachment style, which is a whole bunch of theory that is behind that between 
behind object relations and attachment theory. And Melanie Klein is one of the leading thinkers or was one of the leading thinkers in this theory. So if you're interested in that, check out Melanie Klein. And for the purpose or because of the, the time here, let's just say there are three to four attachment types that you can develop. You can develop a secure attachment to your mother, an avoidant attachment to your mother, an anxious attachment to your mother, or a disorganized attachment to your mother. And obviously, as an infant, all that happens unconsciously, and you probably just don't know what kind of attachment type you are. So this is going to be important for later on, because as an infant, you have developed some kind of attachment to your mother. And what is happening over time that the figure of attachment is changing. At a certain point, you will leave your mother and let's call your mother an object of attachment. I know that object sounds a little bit strange, but it will be important when we continue our train of thought. So your mother is an object of attachment. And now we will talk about so-called transitional objects because you will get detached in a certain way from your mother. You will leave home and then you will attach to other objects. And let's take a look at some of them. At a certain point in life, it starts that you detach from your mother and we're talking about a so-called transitional object. And if you're interested in this theory, Winnicott is one of the people who I think described the transitional object for the first time. So you are transitioning from a mother to another object and the object can be a teddy bear, can be a blanket that you attach to. And there is, by the way, some quite interesting research that um, about 34% of the adults still sleep with their teddy bear. Uh, I mean, it's um, you, you can probably find that in The Guardian if you Google for that. And there are uh, a couple of researchers who digged into that topic. And if you're interested in that study, it's Hood and Bloom. Children prefer certain individuals over perfect duplicates. So the teddy bear seems to have something, whatever it is. Don't go too deep into that here. I'm getting carried away already. Uh, so you detach from your mother and you build a relationship with your teddy bear. This is your transitional object for a certain period of time. And of course, even if 34% of the adults still sleep with their teddy bear, most of us leave the teddy at home if we go to work. So there is another transitional object that we have to talk about. The third object you usually attach to is your partner. So if you're in a relationship, you develop an attachment to your partner. And again, the attachment can be very similar to the attachment that you de have developed as an infant to your mother. So you make a transition from your mother to your teddy to your partner. And that is, you might realize what this is building towards too. There is a fourth step that I would like to cover be before I get back to your role. So here's an example for a fourth attachment, for a fourth transitional object, coming from your mother, a teddy, your partner, to your boss. And think about your former bosses that you had. Think about CEOs of family-owned companies. Sometimes even in certain cultures, they are referred to as the father or the mother of the organization or the team. So you develop an attachment to another person that is more work-related, while the other things are or were more private life related. And now we're getting back to the last aspect, that is the fifth transitional object. You can create an attachment or you can build an attachment to your role. And this is going to create a lot of problems later on if you identify so much with your role that you become the role. And again, we were going to pick that up when we talk about leadership and feedback in another module. But this is going to be very exciting if you attach to your role. And that is creating a problem that we will discuss in the next steps. What is happening in organizational change very often is that we are either changing 
the role that you're having so much that you don't realize that it is your former role, or we even take the role away from you. And that is creating a lot of problems because we are cutting the link between you as an individual and the organization by taking away or altering your role to a very large degree that you don't recognize it anymore. And that is going to be problematic because now this is what is going to happen in many cases. So if we take away your role, it feels pretty much as if we would take away the transitional object and the next transitional object, remember your partner, the next transitional object, remember your teddy bear, and ultimately, and that is the most problematic thing, taking away the mother, which will lead to a so-called strange situation, and then you experience the same attachment style that you have developed, unconsciously developed as an infant to your mother, when we take away your role in the organization. Obviously, you will not throw yourself on your back and start screaming in the midst of the meeting room, but you will show behavior that is linked to your attachment style. So it's quite good to get to know your own attachment style. And especially, it's good to know what you're doing to people if you change their roles too much. If our role is being taken away, one thing that we might experience is a so-called adaption or adjustment disorder. So everything, something, every time something changes in our life, if we relocate, if we change our job, if we change our partner, if we change our role, we have to adapt and adjust to this new thing. And very often we experience adjustment disorders. In most cases, fortunately, we are very well capable and able to deal with this on our own. We don't need professional help. So we adjust. But sometimes we're not able to adjust. That can lead to very problematic situations. And this is hopefully the, the exception to the rule. So we're not going to cover that. But what will happen is that we will feel anxiety. And anxiety is something that is triggering something else, which is called ego defenses. Ego defenses are a tricky thing because they try to protect us from anxiety that we get, for example, if we experience an adaption disorder. And that is a whole new topic that I will cover in another video. But just be aware, if you change the role or take away the role from someone, they might feel anxious. This is triggering ego defenses. They try to defend themselves unconsciously in most cases, and this is creating resistance to change, which is, which is obviously a good thing because it's energy and it's a bad thing because it's preventing us to have a successful change, whatever that means. And that is a topic for another video. So that was a very brief introduction into roles and role theory and how tricky it can be to change roles and to take up roles over the time of your professional life. And at the end, we have seen that very often if roles are changed and we cannot adapt to a role, we experience something that is called adaption disorder, which might trigger anxiety, that might trigger ego defenses, which are all very interesting topics that will be covered in another video. So stay tuned for something else. And if, you're an, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments.